I'm Jim Boyer. I joined the TFF board in 1995, uh, was then at the time a professor in the College of Natural Resources at the University of Minnesota. Um, I joined the TFF executive board in 1996 and then served as chairman from 2006 to 2008. As former uh, TFF President Easter Evans explained, uh, TFF began as an educational organization uh, that soon thereafter um, began operating demonstration sites to facilitate education and research. And the first of these sites was in Kawashi, Brazil, in the Eastern Amazon region. At Kawashi, uh, there was an initial project, a fairly small scale project that dramatically illustrated the differences between logging using traditional practices uh, versus responsible logging employing best practices. And TFF built upon this project, uh, creating training programs within a larger surrounding concession uh, where those involved in the logging industry could come to view better ways of doing things and where scientists, educators, educators and others could come to view and study impacts of forest operations. Um, in the mid nineties in the Amazon, uh, logging looked something like this. Uh, loggers and skitter operators and and those were very often the same individual. Um, they were very often minimally trained. Um, there was no marking of trees to be felled prior to the onset of harvest operations. Um, there was no pre-mapping of stands to be harvested. And what that meant was that there was also no pre-planning of skid trails or log landings. And the operators themselves had little or no training in directional felling and also were not trained uh, to pre-harvest cut vines and lianas that, that often uh, connect uh, trees together. And the combined effect of those two things were the, the lack of directional felling knowledge and, and, uh, and failure to cut vines ahead, vines ahead of harvest meant that uh, trees would be felled. Um, they would very often uh, directly impact other trees, damage them heavily on the way down. In addition, the connecting vines would, would uh, bring down the tops or parts of, of other surrounding trees, uh, create a lot of unnecessary damage uh, with the lack of those two factors in, in training. An additional problem was that skitters were often not properly equipped. And what that meant was that uh, a skitter should have a winch or a grapple on the back, which allows the leading ends of logs to be skidded to be lifted off the ground. Um, if, if the front of a large log is not lifted off the ground prior to skidding, it creates a furrow in the forest floor uh, and furthermore, uh, logs that are simply dragged along the ground are far less maneuverable than if the, than if the leading edge were lifted. Uh, and that means that all along the skid route, uh, there will be scuffing of trees uh, that wouldn't happen if the log were more uh, maneuverable. Um, uh, we also found with respect to skitter that a skitter almost always has a blade on it and uh, an operator not told otherwise will often uh, go through the forest with the blade down. Uh, seldom does it need to be in the down position and that created uh, other damage. Now, the result of not pre-planning skid trails had, a, had another effect, which was quite wasteful. And that was that after a few uh, trees had been felled and skidders were going back and forth into the forest stand to retrieve logs, uh, without skid trails being planned ahead of time, uh, a skidder upper would fell a tree, they would buck the log, they would take the first log to the landing, uh, 
And then after dropping that log, they would not remember what skid trail it was that they had just used. And they were unable to find a remarkable amount of time, almost 18% of the time, they were unable to find the second and third logs uh, from that same tree. And the result was they simply would get left in the forest, a tremendous uh, waste. Um, all of this meant that there was more equipment wear than if uh, less impactful logging were done, less stressful, uh, more um, distance and so forth put on equipment. And our studies also showed that, and as Keister mentioned, um, the damage to the forest was significantly less uh, when best practices were used than if traditional uh, practices were involved. And that meant that the costs of logging were also lower. Um, well, it's quite one thing to talk about what, how, how to do a better job of logging in a classroom setting, but it's quite another to demonstrate what all this looks like to those working in the industry uh, and to help them to, to provide a place where they can actually learn by doing. And this is what TFF brought to tropical forestry. Our workshops at Kawashi and, and later at other DF, TFF demonstration sites were quite intensive. Uh, they were six week sessions. Um, those involved were really fully engaged for the full time they were involved in those workshops. Uh, sessions would typically begin uh, early in the morning uh, in a classroom setting, uh, the classroom being in a tent, uh, often using computers that were running off generators. Um, and then they would take what they were learning in that classroom setting directly out into the surrounding forest. They would be able to see, demonstrated for them what uh, best practices looked like then they themselves would be able to, to practice what they saw, to use equipment and so on. And then the following day, uh, the, the same kind of thing would be repeated. Um, we also ran two week sessions, shorter two week sessions. Uh, those sessions were often done off site, uh, done in surrounding countries. Uh, some of those sessions were done for managers and educators and others who wanted to see what, what reduced impact logging looked like. Um, what we found was, uh, Easter Evans uh, indicated that about 10,000 people went through our, our training programs directly. We also found that many of those who went through our programs uh, took what they learned back to their companies or to their organizations and trained others. Uh, so we know that there was a significant impact in training, uh, indirect training from, from people who had directly taken our programs. Um, in conjunction with training programs, TFF also developed and published detailed and illustrated uh, training manuals. And those training manuals, by the way, were, it, it wasn't a one size fits all thing. Uh, different training manuals were developed for different countries, depending upon differences in situation. But those training manuals were provided to those who went through our training programs and, and to others to use as, as teaching aids um, in, uh, in situations other than, than TFF uh, training programs. Well, TFF operated under a board of directors that ranged from about 30 to 35 people, uh, depending upon the year. And as part of that board of directors were, were players from all uh, different uh, areas of interest, uh, industry was represented, major environmental groups, uh, academia, uh, major donors, um, and government agencies are also involved. And in all of our meetings, financing was a continual topic of discussion. Uh, you can imagine that the challenge of maintaining large-scale operations on three continents was substantial. Um, but nonetheless, TFF managed over a period of almost two decades in securing funding for these operations, which were ultimately spun off as independent operating entities. 
it's no exaggeration to say that TFF had and continues to have a major impact on logging practices in the tropics.